change is just a coin constantly being flipped. Most of the time, it's not a toss between good luck or bad luck, but rather a game of chance for insignificant events in our everyday lives. It's only when the results of the coin are to land on either good fortune or bad that we take notice. But to those gods, who are just picking between heads and tails, it makes no difference. The gods flip pennies, which are so invaluable to us that we don't take notice of the outcome. But when the gods bring dimes and quarters to the game, we spot the twists of fate. The perspective of what is and isn't good luck versus bad luck is as insignificant to the gods as their choice of heads or tails are to you. Just as long as the coin lands favorably for you, nothing else matters. Not what's fair or unfair. Not what's logical or illogical. Not what's just or unjust. Not what's right or wrong. All that matters to you is favorability, regardless of its randomness. Take, for example, Noah, bad kid, took pleasure in things suffering, preferably the little creatures that most of us would consider cute and sweet. A few coin flips of bad luck in Noah's childhood caused him to be this way, but it was his good luck that he got a job at a pet store in which he was able to get unsuspectingly close to these critters that he liked to hurt. These critters, whose coin landed on the opposite side of Noah's, were in for some bad luck. Noah was very social, arguably. He didn't have friends per se, but he belonged to a group of people with a common interest. They hung out in the darkest corners of cyberspace, places in which you need a Tor browser to access and one of those URLs that ended with a dot onion in order to find. What made Noah such a valuable contributor was an impressive balance of quality and quantity. Other contributors with high quality content posted only when they were able to capture an abandoned dog, injured crow, stray cat, or trapped rodent. Not only did the length of this content make for what was considered excellent quality, but the resting periods between postings allowed the content creators to come up with some very original ideas. Low quality content was considered either short posts, lengthwise or in the briefness of the subject suffering, camera problems, angling, brightness, darkness, greeniness, etc. Or unoriginality, the audience could only watch so many wall smashings, decapitations, crushings, and burnings before the club labeled these types of videos boring. Noah was able to meet all demands of quality content because unlike his fellow content creators, he was in a position that would raise suspicion. One of the difficulties that fellow creators in Noah's community had with providing quality was access to animals. That's where having a job at the pet store came in handy. As a customer, you couldn't just walk into a pet store and buy a bunny once every few days, or else you'd raise unwanted attention. Having a position at a pet store, however, was advantageous due to how the industry operates. Most pet stores have animals stored in three locations, the sales floor, new arrivals, and isolation. The animals on the sales floor are what you see and what you can legally purchase. New Arrivals is a location for animals who've been delivered within the last 72 hours and need observation before the pet store can sell them without risking any sort of liability. This location is also where any overstock will wait until there are available cages out on the sales floor. With dozens of livestock in each location, even the most sanitary and caring of pet stores will inevitably have animals who get sick, injured, or are observed to have a deformity. The sick animals will be medicated until full recovery and then put back out on the sales floor or sent back to the new arrivals if there's overstock. The injured or deformed ones, however, can't be sold because of the store's guarantee of standards in the animals they sell. Instead, these creatures who have landed on the wrong side of the god's flips are written out of inventory and put up for adoption. Since the pet store has no obligation to their customer base for animals to be given away for free, 
Employees interested in adopting these injured or deformed creatures get first dibs before the giveaway announcement is made to shoppers. Why would someone want an injured or deformed animal? Compassion aside, some of these animals have very minimal issues. In a knoll or bearded dragon with a tail that got nipped off by accidentally snagging it between a sharp corner and its terrarium was a free exotic animal that was healthy and looked perfect to the credulous eye. Similarly, deformed hamsters also had a demand to those who were able to spot an inbreed. Mill vendors sometimes have difficulty separating genders when the hamsters are just pinkies, which eventually results in breeding within a given litter. Sometimes there isn't a way to spot an inbreed, so it gets sold at regular price. But a common trait of an inbred hamster is teeth that don't grow to their fullest length, or don't grow at all. The mouth of gaps and gums will cause the hamster's face to develop roundly, despite hamsters already having less pointed noses than other rodents, resulting in a teddy bear appearance, and the tongue will frequently stick out of its mouth like a dog. Unlike most things unnatural, these little freaks are cuter than their normal counterparts. So, with injured animals looking normal on camera, and the deformed animals looking exceptionally cuter than usual, topped with Noah's employer assuming that he was just adopting these animals out of the kindness of his heart, Noah was able to produce quality and quantity so well balanced that many within his community referred to him as an auteur. From Noah's perspective, what with the demand and success of his art, the gods had flipped him particularly good luck. There was a different coin being flipped, however, which wasn't between Noah and the animals he was adopting, but rather between him and a man named Jack. Noah knew of the animal rights activists who sought to take down the people of his community and the ease of him constantly evading these noble organizations was just icing on the cake. Another good flip. But what Noah didn't consider was that there was a different but similar type of community who hung out at a different but just as dark of a corner in cyberspace at a different but similar dot onion site that required a Tor browser to access. It was Noah's bad luck that Jack was part of this other community it was also Noah's bad luck that Jack knew the ins and outs of several dark corners in cyberspace, as his assignments were often found in such nooks as Noah's. Being the dedicated professional that Jack was, it was Noah's bad luck that Jack forced himself to get inside the heads of his assignments. Jack had to know their weaknesses. He needed to see the vile things they craved. He wanted to understand everything. The more knowledgeable Jack was about an assignment, the more successful the job was, and thus the more satisfied Jack's clients were. So, Jack studied people in Noah's club very closely. It was on this occasion that brought Jack to the best of luck and Noah the worst. Jack just happened to work at the same pet store, and thus just happened to know Noah and his hobby for adopting animals from isolation. Being that Jack studied underground communities so that he'd have less empathy for his assignments and be as cold-blooded towards them as possible, Jack was therefore regretfully familiar with Noah's anonymous content. It didn't take long for Jack to make a connection between the animals in these videos and the ones that Noah had been adopting. The gods kept flipping the same coin and it kept landing in Jack's favor. Not only did Jack himself love animals, but he also knew of potential clients who, being very aggressive activists, some of whom were extreme enough to put the value of an animal's life over humans, would pay Jack good money to take down the likes of Noah and his entire community. Not only could Jack charge a hefty fee for stopping Noah, he'd also be able to squeeze out the names of other people in Noah's community. People like Noah often traded private messages with each other and eventually developed a closeness with one another. So, Jack knew it was very probable that Noah had names of others like him. Jack could also charge his clients to take care of the names that Noah gave him. This cash flow could go on and on and on until Jack would either get bored or caught, depending on how the god's coin landed. 
the coin between Noah and Jack kept landing in favor of the latter. Jack found clients, Noah gave names, those names gave more names, all names turned into assignments for Jack, and Jack got rich quickly. The gods kept flipping, and Jack kept winning. One day, the gods might use a coin that'll land less favorably for Jack. Just like successfully outrunning the law is a rarity, continuously winning a coin toss is a rarity. Unless someone's cheating. Whoever said the gods were honest? Some gods are smarter than others. Some gods wiser than others. Some gods are weaker, more vulnerable, and foolish. Some gods flip a rigged coin. A coin designed to be heavier on one side, so it always lands the same with each flip. If an honest god is playing with a cheating god, bad things happen to good people. Let's just hope that if you get two cheating gods flipping for your fate, the god on your side brought the rigged coin to the game, just like Jax did. Don't worry about anything else except what's favorable to you. Not what's fair or unfair. Not what's logical or illogical. Not what's just or unjust. Not what's right or wrong. It doesn't matter. If it did, then the coin would always land on what's fair, logical, just, and right. The coin would have to be rigged. The cheating gods would always get rewarded. Winning could only be achieved by being unfair, illogical, unjust, and wrong. Instead, it's all a game of perspective. A dance of good luck and bad luck. Man versus beast. Man is beast. Heads versus tails.